Hello there music lovers and welcome back to the woodshed. So as things are slowly starting to kind of get to the point where we're playing some gigs, I've been working with Gary LaVox. Gary is the lead singer for Rascal Flats, obviously. I worked with the Flats and we've been doing some acoustic shows and the occasional uh, Opry gig. Got to play some electric the last time we were on the Opry. It was really fun playing some of those hero parts. This past weekend, we went up to Kentucky for a private event that Gary was on, and it was Travis Toy on the Dobro, the mighty Jim Riley on the drum kit, Mike Hicks handling keyboards. Please take a second before you finish watching this video, go to all three of those guys' Instagrams and just check out how vicious they are. Just some top level elite musicians. That's Mike Hicks, Travis Toy, and Jim Riley. So that was the house band. I was playing acoustic guitar and mandolin, and it was kind of in that like singer-songwriter kind of vibe. We've been doing a lot of that with Gary. So on the way up, I asked my Patreons, I said, you know, what kind of content would you like to see while I'm on the road? And we had a patron that chimed in and said, how about some survival guide for the sideman type of advice? So needless to say, you ask, I am here to supply. And so we had <laughs> Kelly Clarkson's bus on the way up there. It was kind of funny. It was like themed like, uh, you know, a lot of times in these big fancy buses, they'll like theme them, right? So this one had like Edison lights and it was like the inside of a barn as if it was on wheels and a bus, hardwood floors and all this kind of crazy stuff. Anyways, so I got you guys some footage. For the full interview, jump over to patreon.com slash andywoodmusic. Again, for the full interview, jump over to patreon.com slash andywoodmusic. Now, what I've done for this week's episode of The Woodshed is cherry-pick some really, really good stuff from Jim and Travis on how to be a better sideman, whether that just be playing the weekend warrior gig at the club, at the local uh, you know, biker rally, or maybe it's the church gig you got every Sunday. I know those are kind of polar opposites, but stay with me. Or if you are working for an artist, or if you're aspiring to work for an artist, this is some great advice from some of the top level musical velociraptors that are out there in the game. Sit back, relax, let me give you some of those highlights, and if you want that full interview, jump over to patreon.com slash andywoodmusic. Roll it! So we're riding up the road here, headed to Kentucky. Gary Lavox gig. Figure out to do a little game here. A little game of some advice from some uh, two of the, the finest hired guns in the game. Mr. Travis Toy and Jim Riley. I'm going to flip it over to them. So ranging from being the weekend warrior, uh, playing at the local club with your buddies, all the way up to the, the big leagues, the arenas, and Jimmy Kimmel's and CMA Fest and all that stuff. Travis, what would be three points of advice that you would say to be this? Yeah, yeah. One, you could do four. You could do two. But what would be some points of advice for the side man? And, and uh, just how to thrive in that role. You mean? Yeah. What What would be? Uh, what would make you uh, outside of just thriving? Like, what are things like lessons learned, things to take note of outside of the obvious? Yeah. I think. Uh, I'll be, this may be the first time I've not been sarcastic in one of your videos. Which is good. Giving actual advice. Um, I think an, an overlooked thing by a lot of younger guys is just the fact that, um, and Jim and I have experienced this with, with different people, that one of your biggest jobs as a side man is to make sure you are pushing positive energy towards your artist um, no artist in the world wants to turn around and see you know not necessarily guys who don't look like they want to be there but just who are not contributing to the positive energy and all those things on the stage um, yeah. yeah I mean if you're a front man you know and you turn if you turn around and you want to see your bands having a great time you know they're they're you know whatever their role is you know some depending on the configuration sometimes you're in the back you're not really supposed to be in front if that's the case you still though have to be participating in the vibe and the energy sometimes it's your job to get out and hot dog and run around and do the stuff you know play solo whatever that's great too and it's easier to do in that aspect because you feel like you're 
you're up there and you're involved, but it's, yeah, it's not hard to do when you're in the background, but it's something you have to keep in mind, I think. I've it's always, a gigantic role. I've always thought about that. I've always thought about the fact that we never really knew everything that, you know, the Rascal Flats guys were going through, how many interviews they had to do, how many uh, radio station uh, meetings they had to go to, and, you know, what was going on in their life, and, and how much of a deficit for energy they were at, and so I always felt like, personally, from even from behind the drums, where I almost never got to get out in front, I felt like it was my job to have an excess of energy to, you know, to fill any gaps that might be where they're at. I felt like that was part of my role. So I, I, yeah. Travis uh, said something to me. Um, we were talking about playing on people's uh, records, you know, and we both had the opportunity to play on some really big records, and yet we also have the opportunity frequently to play on not big records and small records and records that only matter to the people that are making them and the people that love them and some of them are good and some of them are bad and something that he pointed out to me that I that I really took to heart was you know just because a song's bad doesn't mean you have to sound bad it doesn't mean you can't give every bit of your heart into that performance and you know, I take that from the studio perspective, but especially on the live perspective. You know, no matter what my surroundings are, I want to play it with the same confidence and heart that I would play if I was playing a big arena show. And I always used to think about when I would be in a club, if, if I was, if, and this would happen a lot, where there would be five people in the club, I would imagine that one of those people was the person that could change my life. And that could be the person that could th offer me the gig that changed my life. And you know what? Eventually it was. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's good. Switch the angle. Little, little topic you guys have heard me say a lot. Two is one and one is none. If you've got one guitar cable and that's all it, it takes for you to plug in, you better take two. If you got one battery in your backpack, you better better take two. You know, that, that kind of just yeah. over-preparedness on the gear side. That never goes away from this, from your first gig at the smallest place, from your high school talent show, all the way up to the biggest gig you ever play. And that's where you actually start to see there is a, a point in a career where you physically can't take an inventory of the things you need. And that's where guitar takes and drum takes. That's why they have a job right. is because that two is one, one is none thing starts magnifying the bigger the, the gig gets. Oh, yeah. I mean, I'll never forget the first time that we, we really ended up with a like a, a big time production manager out here on the road with us uh, and he walked back to my rig and he said um, so this computer right here he says what does this computer do I said well I, I run you know uh, the click track uh, it, it pushes time code to some different things and uh, you know any of the little backing tracks that we might have but basically it's the heart of the secret synchronization of our big show he says Okay, he says, and you have one of those. <laughs> I said, yeah. He said, that's ridiculous. <laughs> and the next week we were ordering, you know, like, I mean, super expensive, you know, I mean, ordered $20,000 worth of gear, but he's like, what's $20,000 worth of gear to a multi-million dollar show? You know, you're not thinking about it the right way if you're, if you're not investing the right amounts into your craft. And, you know, and sometimes, on our level, we might go, well, that's a, an expensive piece of gear. But if that's the thing that's going to save you when, you're, you know, when your other piece goes down, how valuable does it become? Oh, God. And, and that, that ties in to uh, when guys on a club level, some of you guys probably doing some weekend warrior stuff, the cost of an in-ear rig looks really expensive, or even just the packs and molds themselves. That can be... You know, that can easily get $1,000, $2,000, but my God, how much do you spend on a drum kit? How much do you spend on a steel? How much do I spend on a guitar? And then the last thing in the signal chain is what I'm going to put in my ear, and I'm going to get cheap there right, and right, get a Radio right. Shack bud to put in my ear. Like, now you've just shortchanged that $10,000 steel. Don't, don't go got. cheap on me, Dodson. That's right. Yeah. Oh, don't get cheap on me now, Dodson. <laughs> that, that was Hammond's mistake. Yeah, that was Hammond's mistake. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so... Let's say, this is something I think all three of us have had to do at some point or another. How do you multitask 
a lot of different information musically. Let's say you've got the, the thing that we were all on recently was the woodshed camp stuff. These guys had to pull a lot of duty, learn a lot of different genres of music, while also maybe prepping a flats acoustic thing for Gary or you know rearranging tunes. How do you compartmentalize and what are some tips that maybe you can give these guys for just retaining information? Because I think we at a level where you're, where you're in the game and you do it 24 hours a day, it's different, but like I think it's still hard for guys on the weekend to memorize a couple hundred tunes for a week. Travis yeah. and I actually prepared differently for the woodshed. I'll let him <laughs> say, explain what he, he was doing on the woodshed. Like woodshed specific, so like that's an interesting role for me. Is like I'm playing with, I'm a steel player, but that's which is normally not a rhythm section instrument, but Andy hires me to be basically the only other corded instrument on the gig, so I'm sort of playing the role of, you know. Instead of a keyboard keyboard player, that's, yeah, 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 yeah. Rhythm guitar, anything besides bass and drums, and the lead player. Well, because it gets so redundant when you've got six of the world's best guitar players, the last thing you need is another rhythm guitar player. player, (laughs) Yes, you don't need that. But, uh, yeah, I mean, my approach for that stuff, I usually, and, and actually this goes for anything, even if I was doing, learning, you know, 100 tunes for a club thing, my process for that is I always learn the hardest stuff first. Uh, things that will take me the longest on the woodshed that is always Mark and Terry's uh, material. Because <laughs> it's um, keyboard heavy, right? Well, it's just change heavy. The, the Mark's, change Mark's heavy. tunes are so interesting and they're not, there's always like, he, he says, <laughs> you're going to get this. Mark sends yeah. charts for all of it. But they're notated. I don't read notated music. Um, I, I mean, I read number charts and everything for, for a living. But I'm 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 a dummy in the music realm. I don't. I know a lot of theory, but I'm very self-taught, and, and I don't read uh, standard notation at all. So he sends standard notation charts, which do nothing. For me. So and like you know, on a chart you'll have you know A section, B section, C section maybe. Mark's literally are like A through H. It's like section after section after section, all different. So that stuff. I have to learn that stuff. I, instead of trying to chart it, it's just so much. Like it's better for me to. So I mean, my process for that. About a week out from that gig, I started with the hardest stuff, or the not even the hardest stuff, just the most to remember, which is Mark stuff. And I'll I'll sit there and just work through a tune until I've drilled it into my head. Maybe it's like a couple of hours or something, you know. Hopefully not that long, but sometimes for some of this stuff. Um, and I'll, I'll go through a couple. I don't try to overload myself too much. I might go through two or three tunes. And then the, the wacky thing is, in, in the midst of that, I'm also doing overdubs and working in my studio for completely unrelated stuff. Um, luckily, I don't have to memorize any of that stuff. I'm just making stuff up. But but the following morning, I'm going, Jesus, what were those three tunes that like I learned? So I, I make sure I, I go back through those and then learn some more. And then, you know, third day, Go back through all the stuff I learned, add some more to it, um, and that's the stuff. So like, but you know, I've, I've kind of knew Andy's stuff because I've done it. But the, and you played all my stuff too. Yeah, yeah, stuff, yeah. So his stuff wasn't as bad, even though there's still a lot to remember. It's sure. Stuff that I don't necessarily retain because I'm not playing it all the time. Um, it's not completely unfamiliar though. But, um, but then you've got, you know, somebody uh, like Greg Cox stuff's really fun, but it's not difficult change wise I mean it's basically blues so that stuff for me I mean I, I listen to it basically and go okay that'll be fine like I don't even there's really nothing to remember it's standard you know form like blues stuff uh, I don't know that's my problem I always start with the, the hardest stuff if, if I was going to learn a country show you know that's like not crazy fusion stuff I always start with the hardest stuff what are the songs I have a solo in what are the songs that I have a lot of fills in or something I'll always start with those because there's always some where I don't necessarily have a big role in those are the ones I'll I'll push to the end because there's not either there's nothing to remember or there's very little to remember uh, so that's my process I start with the most the hardest stuff and then work down and also honestly too that way I always do have to, if I'm kicking something off or solo that way if I run out of time the things that I kept to the end were the simplest things, and maybe it's some stuff that I can just wing my way through. You know? <laughs> I didn't yeah. necessarily have to listen to it, you know, where I can look at somebody that can be going, yeah, yeah, telling yeah. me, you know, like in the moment. So that's my process. Yeah. So going back to like 
22 years ago when I was prepping for the Rascal Flats thing. I was playing with uh, nine, 90s artists, was almost just finished the 90s. I was playing with Mark Chestnut. And then, Chestnut. 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 And um, so I was playing with Mark, and um, I was also playing with uh, Sheldon, yeah, Hank nice. Williams 3, Hank 3. And um, I was playing with them at the same time and prepping for the Rascal Flats gig. I had about two weeks to, to get ready. And so my process, the first thing that was actually interesting, that even though there's a lot of guitar players here, I will share this with you. When I was playing with Mark, I was, even as a professional, I was really unhappy with the ergonomics of my setup. So one of the things that I did when I when I started with Rascal Flats was I completely tore my drum set down to nothing. Started with a drum throne, added the snare drum, added the bass drum and the hi-hat, added the ride cymbal, which is, you know, a really important timekeeping uh, instrument for me, and then added everything around that. And, and, and that was actually the moment where I kind of really changed my drum set to an ergonomics thing. But the other thing I did was I charted everything out. And it, it, as a drummer, it's uncommon to, 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 to do it this way, but I'm actually always charting everything out in national number system charts because for me, I'm not as concerned about what the drum part was or what the drum part might be. I'm more concerned with what everybody else is going to play, and that uh, yeah. helps me realize what it is that I need to play yeah. so that no matter what I'm playing, whether it's the most difficult stuff or the simplest stuff that I'm always playing for the song. Okay. So I chart I, I chart everything, and if it's if it's a simple song, in some ways, I feel like the chart's more important because yes. it's the little differences that that make make the difference. Great thing about a national number system chart is if you understand the system, you you know that you're in an A section and you know you're in a verse depending on what kind of form it is. You know, you can look up in a way for that entire section and then and then look back when things are going to the next section. I think the key is, um, as a side man is to always be looking and thinking ahead. A lot of guys out here that may not know what the Nashville number system is in, in, in my little woodshed community, uh, Jim literally wrote the book on it. So, Jim, where can they get that book if you want to know what we're talking about? Um, so I wrote a book called Song Charting Made Easy. You can, if you put Jim Riley on Amazon, it would be the you know, first or second thing to pop up. But it's a great system. You know, the music theory of the music that we play, it's always there whether we want to acknowledge it or not, and uh, no matter what instrument you play, and I, I stress this particularly with drummers, you know, the more you know about the music that you're playing, the more you fully understand it, the better you can serve the song. It really doesn't matter if you're sitting at your house playing Crazy Train every Saturday, like, or if you're playing with Ozzy every Saturday bringing the best version of yourself forward uh, ties into the very first thing that Travis said, which is like having great energy. He completely missed that, by the way. Yes. It, it was I wasn't going to rat on him, but he did. But tying it, tying in that best version of yourself, uh, that energy, that that's, that's infectious. Like the best version that you can put out when you start with yourself translates to the guy that you're on stage with that's your drummer it translates to your steel player translates to your artist that you're working for or if you're the artist i think it's important that you push good energy no matter what pinnacle you, you get to in your career that's you it you always have to continue to improve i think about it like when you're at the airport and you got those people movers yeah if you're standing still you know, like like here, people are always moving forward. So when you think you're standing still, people are moving ahead of you. Yeah. You know, everyone is always progressing. So if you're not progressing, you're actually falling behind. Yeah. So, you know, it doesn't matter what place you are at in your career, you always want to be constantly improving at your craft. Yeah. All right. Thank you guys for hanging out this week in the woodshed. If you're looking for dates that we're going to be playing, if you're looking to score some tabs and transcriptions, or if you're looking to buy a bundle that comes with the Axfex patch, the tablature, the guitar profile, the backing track, or maybe if you're looking to find out where we're playing, jump over to andywoodmusic.com. we got an email list there that you can sign up for. That's also if you're interested in 
maybe booking a private lesson with me or any kind of that kind of stuff, jump over to andywoodmusic.com. Now, as mentioned earlier, I offer a ton of exclusive content to my Patreon community, my Woodshed fam over there at Patreon. We got all kinds of things. The basic tier gets you in, gets you access to over hundreds of videos. The next tier up gets you access to our private Discord community, which is really rad. Way for everybody to kind of chat and keep up with everything in the music industry, sharing videos and, and transcriptions and things like that. We do a weekly live Zoom masterclass, and that is at Patreon dot com slash Andy Wood Music. That live Zoom masterclass happens weekly, so you get four of those a week. Sign up over at patreon.com slash Andy Wood Music, and we will see you guys real soon.